Thank you very much, Maya. I appreciate it. And, and welcome back to everybody. To me, this feels like a homecoming. I've been coming to San Francisco since my college days, and my two sisters live here. And like many of you, coming back to San Francisco is a fun thing. I especially am thankful that many of you are back here with this particular meeting. It's great to see many of you, see um, old friends, new friends, and, and other people as well. The topic in front of us is going to be epidural equinox. Now, certainly, Mark just talked about remifentanil and how its use is growing and perhaps very useful in those conditions or times where women can't receive a neuraxial technique. But as we recognize, the majority of the time, we can use neuraxial technique. And we have to make sure that it's up to par, up to snuff, and, and ready to roll. In terms of looking at the epidural technique, I'm thinking about it. The reason why I've called this equinox is a couple of reasons. First, if you look up the dic dictionary definition of equinox, it's when the sun crosses the celestial equator, making the time of day equivalent to the time of night. And as you know, here in obstetrics, we have no deviation between day and night. We have to be able to do our technique at any point in time. But the other reason I named it this was for a song that was written by this gentleman, John Coltrane. And what I liked about Coltrane is he was the preeminent musician in jazz at the time of his um, sort of popularity, and that is 1960s and 1970s. And the reason why he was probably popular was because he had real attention to his craft. He was known to take a rift of notes, which is a collection of four to 10 notes, and sometimes he'd practice that for four or five hours at a time. Um, moreover, he played with different types of instruments to give him a wide variety of, of different approaches. And, and because of that, his attention is the way that we should look at our own techniques. And this would be a question-based analysis of our own. And we're going to ask ourselves if some of these interventions are things that we've already incorporated, some that we're comfortable with, and some, perhaps, that we'll have to change and incorporate into our practices. But once we decide to do that, we need to practice, practice, and practice. Now, you may be familiar with the Sound of Music musical that was on Broadway in 1959. This, uh, my Favorite Things, the Roger Hammerstein tune that came out of this, was one of the most brilliant and one of the most sort of popular tunes to come out of that Broadway show tune. It was one of John Coltrane's favorite songs as well. In fact, he was known to take this one song, and it's a 40-bar measure. It's an E-flat waltz. It, you play it end to end, it takes you about, 40, uh, about four minutes. He was known to take this one song, and sometimes he'd play only this one song for an entire concert. He was also to record it on 18 different albums. It was truly his sort of perfection statement. And similarly, I think we have our favorite ways of doing things, and sometimes those things need to be challenged, re-examined, or incorporated. And one of them is certainly patient positioning. Now, by a show of hands, could I see how many people, by and large, sit their patients up when they do placements? OK, wide majority there. Now, there may be some advantages to sitting the patient up, admittedly, but there could be advantages to the lateral position as well. And in part, it has to do with patient movement. There have been a number of studies looking at kinetic motion of women in pregnancy. And even fully pregnant at 40 weeks gestation, the limitation in movement, both forwards and backwards, side to side, and even rotational, is only 2 to 3%. And we've witnessed all those movements when we're trying to do placements. I know that. When you have someone in the lateral position, you actually have them secured by the bed. They can't move forwards and backwards because the frictional coefficient of the bed. They can't move side to side because the bed is in the way. And overall, they can take a more relaxed posture. And that posture of non-movement is certainly helpful to us. But there are some other reasons, especially in obstetrics, why a lateral position might be valuable. And that is if you have a cord prolapse or if you have a fetal part presenting, these are individuals that you can't sit up. As such, the labor analgesia will actually have to move on to other types of analgesia. Or if you're going in for an operative delivery, you'll have to commit that patient to a general anesthetic. So 
if you can do their technique in a lateral position, if you gain comfort with that technique, then that will be something that you can add to your armamentarium. There are other advantages of the lateral position as well. Bahar illustrated this when he randomized 900 patients to either a seated, a lateral, or a lateral 10 degree Trendelenburg position. And what he found was that in the lateral Trendelenburg position, but also just the lateral position, that blood in the needle was less and blood in the catheter was less. And you may think this is only for a normal sized individual. He also randomized 450 patients of high BMI to those same three positions and found that there was advantage with the lateral Trendelenburg or the, just the lateral position in terms of blood in the catheter here. And that overall correlated, if you take both studies together, to less overall attempts because of less need of replacement of the catheter when performed in the lateral space. Now, how does this make sense? Well, Igarashi provides some answer to that. What Igarashi did was he took a fiber optic scope and threaded it through an epidural needle. So he took individuals that were first in a non-pregnant state, examined their epidural space, and found that the venous collateral system was very diminished, very small, very natural, not something that prevents uh, the intrusion of a catheter or a needle. But when you take those individuals at 12 weeks of pregnancy, you find that there's further engorgement of the venous system. And finally, when you get to full term, you have engorgement and further recruitment of the venous collaterals within the epidural space. The epidural system, the valveless, is, is valveless. The venous system is, doesn't present any sort of barriers to the change in hydrodynamic pressure. So if you sit a column of fluid up, it's going to translocate to the bottom elements of that venous channel, and that's going to be in the lumbar segments where you're going to be operating your needle as well as your catheter. So a uh, consideration for the lateral approach. How about epidural needle placement? When we think about this, does the bevel of the needle make a difference in terms of facing it cephalad or left or right or perhaps caudad? Is one better than the other? And this was a question that was addressed by the Huffnagel sisters out of Temple, Sue and Jane. And basically what they did was they randomized 160 patients, so 40 in each group, to either have the needle bevel face cephalad left or right or caudad. And what they found was that cephalad orientation had the least number of one-sided blocks, the least number of inadequate blocks, and also the greatest number of parturients with comfort. So truly, the cephalid orientation is beneficial. Now, what's interesting is there have been a couple orthopedic papers that have derived some information from this. That is to say, if you're coming in for a left knee replacement, that some individuals are actually turning the bevel of the needle for the epidural technique to the left side. And these orthopedic papers actually suggest that you have better block coverage on the affected or surgical side. And what patient wouldn't want that? I mean, if you're coming in for a unilateral surgery, you want the block on the unilateral side. However, what we know in obstetrics is it's a bilateral procedure. We want both sides. Sometimes we get one side, but definitely both sides is what we want. So cephalite orientation is good. How about epidural space identification? Many of us have our favorite ways of doing things. Uh, show of hands, how many loss of resistance to saline? Okay, good number. Anybody lost resistance to air? All right. And to some people, that might be a generational divide, but I'm not saying that it is. I, I, certainly, I trained with loss of resistance to air. And for the longest time, loss of resistance to air was my technique. However, as we started doing some studies with this, I made the conversion. Not that one or the other may be advantage, have an advantage, but we'll talk about that. And we'll consider whether or not one has a value over the other. And when we think about this and you subject it to different types of studies, including meta-analyses, you'll find that in, in terms of differences and looking specifically at unblocked segments, incomplete analgesia, or the episodes of posterior puncture headache, that there's surprisingly no difference. 
Um, Scott Siegel, the next speaker that's going to be coming up, did a nice meta-analysis that demonstrated that there was no statistical difference between the two techniques. And it probably indicates that we do what we do best, we're very familiar with that technique, and as such, we're very successful with that technique. I will say, however, that there are a couple places where I probably would not do a loss resistance to air technique. One would be the woman that has a postural puncture headache and I'm doing a blood patch, because some of that air may communicate over. The other is a woman that might have an AV canal connection so that you can get air into the systemic circulation and maybe go up to the brain and, and not do any good up there. But in terms of looking at complications specifically, we know that air has a number of complications, both in the subcutaneous tissues and then as it enters sometimes the head. And we had a case, and this was represented up by this um, graph here, or this picture, of a woman that had a loss resistance to air technique. She got some air in the intrathecal or spinal space. It was such significant pain, such distortion of her vision, and a diminution of her hearing that after birth, we sent her to the hyperbaric chamber to be decompressed. Um, so this is certainly an outcome that can happen, sometimes with even small amounts of air. However, saline has its complications as well. And as we're doing our placements, now this never happens to you, but you get that drop of fluid coming back out and you start pondering, hmm, could this be CSF? Or is this merely the saline that I've introduced? Or I know some of my private practice colleagues, um, uh, good friends of mine, actually do loss resistance to local anesthetic, which I don't quite think should be a technique of choice, but they certainly do it and they have found success with it. But what happens when you get that little drop of fluid that's coming back? How do you distinguish whether or not it's CSF, or if it's your local anesthetic, or if it's your saline, more commonly. El Bahisi addressed this question by looking at a couple different factors. And what they did was they looked at the warmth or the temperature of the fluid, and you don't have to do this on an ungloved hand. You can actually do it through a glove, and you can distinguish some temperature differences. And warmth told you that it's most likely CSF. pH differences. And if it was greater than eight, this was CSF. And the presence of glucose, so taste, and protein as well. But what El Bahisi demonstrated, however, was that you needed all four factors in order to definitively tell one from the other. And the most difficult discriminator to have between the two was pH. Because sometimes the pH would come back as 7.2 or 7.4, 7.6. And because you didn't have all four factors that could distinguish the two, you could not tell the difference. And as such, we most commonly do just a provocative test. We threaten the catheter, we dose it very judiciously, and then we see what the reaction is. And based on that reaction, we determine whether or not it's a spinal or an epidural catheter. So let's think about the way that we test that catheter because perhaps we want to engage the idea of whether or not it is a spinal catheter or if it's an epidural catheter or if it's in a location that we don't want, such as intravenously. And the question that we pose here is, do you use a test dose? And I would submit that many people do, and probably the one that they use most is lidocaine, three milliliters, 1.5% uh, with some epinephrine in it. And the question you have to ask is, is this test sensitive? And if you look at the epinephrine component, and you look specifically in pregnant women, and you're looking for heart rate changes, sometimes those heart rate changes won't occur because of the increased volume of distribution that occurs during pregnancy, but also that it could be masked by a contraction occurring at a similar or near similar time. So then you're relying on the lidocaine, and you're saying this 45 milligrams of lidocaine, if it's intravascular, will that tell me I'm intravascular? And the response is no. They've done a number of studies in the UK, um, those crazy Brits. Uh, I can say that because my wife is British. But um, it takes reliably about 100 milligrams of lidocaine in order to 
distinguish whether or not you're intravascular with lidocaine. Okay? So let's talk about the intrathecal component. Yes, absolutely, lidocaine in the spinal space will give you a nice spinal anesthetic, but do you really want a spinal anesthetic for a labor analgesia? And I would submit you do not. The other question we have to concern ourselves with is whether or not it's harmful. And there are a couple of case reports that even that small amount of epinephrine, admittedly in women that have preeclampsia or gestational hypertension or hypertension, had catastrophic increases in their blood pressure, and that was also associated with decreased uterine blood flow. So perhaps we could be doing harm with this. And finally, if you're someplace that allows ambulation, just that small amount even if properly placed in the epidural space, will impair ambulation. And if you don't allow ambulation, it'll at least impair motor mobility. And there are not many parturients that like having dead, numb legs while in bed, enjoying their epidural analgesic, admittedly, but they want to be able to move from side to side. So what guidance can we give? Avoid epinephrine if it's a concern, if you want to continue using it. Change your threshold for instead of the 15 or 20 beats per minute that many people use to 10 beats per minute change. Monitor the maternal heart rate. I can't tell you how many institutions I've been in where they tell me that they use this epinephrine to distinguish heart rate changes, and yet there's not a pulse ox on, there's not an EKG on, and a, they're not holding on to the pulse. I'm just thinking they're watching this little vein right here kind of pulse back and forth. So if you're claiming that you're monitoring it, then monitor it. And also avoid during uterine contractions. And finally, with everything, every dose that we give through a catheter, we should witness what happens and do a careful clinical assessment. How about saline prior to the catheter? Is this something of benefit? And does anybody do this? You know, okay, I see a lot of positive hands. Yeah, I mean, many of us uh, are under the belief, certainly, if that perhaps that saline pushes away something in the epidural space or expands the epidural space. And certainly, if we do a loss of resistance to saline technique, we are incorporating saline into the epidural space before we thread the catheter. The question is, is whether or not this makes any difference. And Gadela did a nice study where they randomized individuals to have either zero milliliters of saline they did a loss of resistance to air technique, or to 10 milliliters of saline. And basically what they found was that in the saline group, 2% chance. In the dry group, 20% instance. So it did make a difference. And this is perhaps one reason why we like the loss of resistance to saline technique. This said, we have performed a meta-analysis looking at the different studies, and there does seem to be value in placing some amount of saline before you thread the catheter. So we cut the incidence of this blood in the catheter by 13% to 6%, so about half. Um, what is interesting, however, is most of these studies were done before the flexible tip catheters were in play. And many of us use the spiral round stainless steel coiled catheters that have a flexible tip. In fact, some of these studies were done when nylon was used, and nylon was very stiff. Um, I remember when I first started, we actually used nylon catheters that had a stylet in them. I mean, and you could push that thing through a brick wall. I mean, it was pretty, pretty impressive. But in looking at the effect of those flexible tip catheters, we also recognize that these have an advantage in terms of not getting into mischief. And so there may be some benefit to looking at your catheter selections when you do your epidural placements. Now, how about securing the catheter? You've gone through all the trouble of locating the epidural space. You're threaded in the catheter. It functioned and it seemed to thread beautifully. What are you going to do to secure that catheter? And when exactly do you tape the catheter? And in evaluating this, we have that question that's posed. And that's, does patient movement actually correspond to catheter movement? And have you guys sort of witnessed this? I mean, sometimes you have the patient move, or, or maybe you've uh, examined an analgesic that might be one-sided or something. You go back in there, and it seems like uh, a leprechaun has been moving your catheter around. 
I mean, many of us have witnessed that casters do seem to move. Well, Catherine Hamilton did a nice study when she was a fellow at Stanford. And basically what they did was they took 255 Tartarians, did a placement, five centimeters to his face. But before they taped the catheter in, they had the patient sit up and then take a lateral position. And they examined whether or not the catheter moved. And it did appear to move in the majority, the wide majority of patients. Now, I've created a couple cartoons for you here. And basically what they were saying is that when you're hunched over, you have the skin and the soft tissues and everything compressed against those spinous processes. However, when you have that patient sit up, those tissues relax away from the epidural space. They relax away from the spinous processes. And as such, if you've taped that catheter in, it's now going to be moved. But if you don't tape it in until you lay them down, you actually allow it passive movement of the soft tissues around that catheter. And as such, you preserve its location in the epidural space. Now, contrast that, as I mentioned, to the episode where you, you know, put your mastic on, you put your tegaderm on, you put your duct tape on, um, and you have the patient sit up because you don't want that catheter moved. It's just moved on you. And it's moved because the natural forces of those soft tissues and the skin are relaxing away from the epidural space. And how much does it move? Well, these are Hamilton's results. And basically, they indicated that from flex to up position, there's some movement. There's more movement from the up position to the lateral position. And overall, you can see great movement sometimes, four centimeters of catheter movement in some individuals. So if you're someone who only places a catheter in three centimeters, that catheter is out. Moreover, when you think about, well, I'm just going to not worry about this and just thread in more catheter, like maybe I'll just leave a little nubbin that you can connect the, the tubing on right at the skin. The problem with doing that is you'll get more one-sided blocks. And there, there's been a number of studies, a nice one by Jake Phelan, three, five, and seven centimeters showed that the seven centimeter placement into the epidural space led to a lot more one-sided blocks. Okay. So now that you've placed that catheter, you want to make an impression with it. How do you dose it? And does dosing actually matter? And the question here is whether or not if we use very dilute solutions, we're better off than if we're using concentrated solutions. And Francois Christians did a very nice study of this in Switzerland. Um, and basically what they demonstrated was if you use bupivacaine and you use 20 milligrams, but in some you use a very concentrated form of that bupivacaine, so four milliliters. The other you use a very dilute concentration, so 20 milliliters, but it's the same 20 milligram amount that you have more pain relief with the more dilute solutions. Uh, admittedly, there's some greater motor block, and that's because of the diffusion to the different levels that also involve the motor sort of pathways. However, overall, the duration increases as well. This and many other studies, some that we conducted, was the reason why we shifted away from 10 to 12 milliliters of quarter percent bupivacaine to 20 milliliters of 0.125 percent bupivacaine. And we found great advantage in doing so. How about dosing the catheter, and specifically that situation that we all face? Well, at least I face. I mean, you guys don't have one-sided blocks, but we certainly do. And what do you do in that situation? Do you dose the catheter? Do you pull back the catheter and dose it? And this was a question that was addressed at Jake Balin at Mount Sinai. And basically, they took individuals, they thread the catheter in five centimeters into the space. They found women that had one-sided blocks. And they randomized half those women to either just receive five milliliters of local anesthetic, whereas the other half, they pulled the catheter back one centimeter and then dosed the catheter. And you wonder, hmm, does this make a difference? And should I be going through the shenanigans of pulling down the tegaderm pulling back the catheter, retaping things, and then dosing. And what they found was this. 
that if you compared the people that only received local versus those where you pulled back the captor and then did local, that there was no difference between the two. Both became comfortable in rel relatively three quarters of the time. Now it's interesting because if the initial therapy did not work, what Jake did in the study was he then did the opposite. So in the group that he only gave local anesthetic, if they were still uncomfortable, then he pulled back the catheter and gave more local anesthetic. In the group that he pulled it back initially and gave local anesthetic, then he just gave more local anesthetic. And what he found was he got 100% of the patients comfortable. Now, I've challenged Jake on this for a couple of reasons. One, I say, Jake, we, you and I have both been doing obstetric anal anesthesia and analgesia for, for a while. We both do studies. There is oftentimes that one side of patient that I cannot get comfortable. And I'm quite surprised that you got 100% of the women comfortable. And you know, he said, well, that's what we found in the study. And I know Jake. I find him to be an ethical guy, does great research, good clinician. And so I have to take him at face value. But the other question I asked him was, well, if you believe that local only works, then why not just give another bolus of local only? Because that way you'll truly tell whether just volume makes a difference for one side of loss. And he said, well, that's a good idea. We should have done that, but we didn't. And therefore, this is what we have. But other people can do that study. And um, we're engaged in that study right now. Hopefully, we'll have some results in the next year or two. Uh, to see if all you need to do is just bolus and whether or not that's more successful than doing any manipulation of the catheter. How about the use of neuraxial opioids? Do they actually make a difference, especially when you're trying to generate analgesia? And Yehuda Guinnessar out of Tel Aviv did much of the work here, in part when he was out at Stanford doing a fellowship and then was on staff. And basically what he demonstrated was a difference between bolus dosing of fentanyl versus an infusion dose. And what we found with infusions was that it was just very similar to systemic sort of analgesia. It was being dosed so slowly that it just got absorbed, and you couldn't distinguish the two really from if you gave the same amount, slow dose, in the IV format. However, he found if you bolus that dose at a single point in time, you got a segmental effect. So you got the opioid receptors within the neuraxium as well as a central effect. Peter Eichenberger did another dose response study where they looked at 50, 75, and 100 mics of fentanyl for labor analgesia and found that 100 mics was what was necessary to get the optimal analgesia input from fentanyl for labor analgesia. And Yehuda also demonstrated, again, in that sort of bolus versus infusion sort of format that you get three times the bang out of the buck if you give it epidurally than if you give it fentanyl. So if I, for example, have a woman undergoing cesarean delivery, uncomfortable, um, I've already given some opioids, and I have a little opioid left over, fentanyl, maybe 90 mics, um, I will give that through the epidural space rather than intravenously because I feel like it gives us both the spinal mu opioid receptors as well as the systemic mu opioid receptors. And finally, combined spinal epidural versus epidural technique. Does one really provide better analgesia? And in looking at this question, John Thomas was one of our fellows. Uh, he went down to Wake Forest, completed the study. When they looked at 27 gauge needles for labor analgesia, they found no difference. And this is what's called the dural puncture epidural. We coined this term. Um, essentially what it is, is when you do an epidural technique, you can either do it standard or before you dose the catheter or before you take a, away the epidural needle, you actually do a puncture with the needle, kind of like a combined spinal epidural, but you don't place anything into the spinal space. You just thread in the catheter and then dose up the epidural like you normally would. Um, the idea came from Suzuki in individuals undergoing orthopedic surgery, and what they were using was a 26-gauge needle using surgical doses. And basically, what they found was there was a difference in terms of onset of the analgesia 
as well as sacral coverage of the anesthesia. So with John, acknowledging that 27 gauge didn't make a difference, I thought that we should repeat the study using the needle that we utilize on a common basis, which is a 25 gauge needle. And what we demonstrated by doing this, and this, once again, you're only doing the dural puncture and then loading up the epidural space like you normally would, we found faster onset, greater sacral spread, improved bilateral block, and no fetal heart rate or bradycardias or postural puncture headaches. So what it says is that small conduit that you've now created between the epidural and the intrathecal sac is something that provides you with some analgesia. It is something that provides you with an improvement in your technique. Now, many of you do dural puncture epidurals anyhow, um, some with the larger epidural needle, admittedly, not commonly, <laughs> but some with smaller needles as well. And even when you do a combined spinal epidural technique, you're in effect creating that conduit for passage of epidural meds into the dural sac, and there's an advantage of that. So what did we talk about today? One, we indicated that lateral positions have its advantages, specifically in obstetrics, both in terms of reducing those bloody catheters as well as blood in the needle, that commonly you might be faced with a situation where you can't sit the patient up. That cephalide orientation of your needle is beneficial, especially if you want a bilateral block. That perhaps we should be moving towards a more of a saline approach than an air approach, not because there is a difference in terms of the two techniques, but when you have complications between the techniques or contraindications to air, you want to be comfortable with that technique. Testos do have their limitations, specifically the lidocaine with epinephrine. Uh, the use of saline prior to catheters is beneficial, and perhaps we do that with our loss of resistance to saline technique that we should allow individuals to change posture before we tape in the catheters. Now, in normal BMI women, what we oftentimes do if we have them in the seated location is we'll just have them relax, and then we'll tape in the catheter. However, with high BMI individuals, we actually have them lay down on their sides, and then we tape in the catheters. I must say, in that paper, David Chestnut wrote the editorial for that piece and said that it was one of the pieces of literature that really changed his practice. Um, and I helped him edit his textbooks, and I, I know the scrutiny that he applies to pieces of literature, and I appreciate what he said about that. That we should also think about large initial doses that are less concentrated, that we can think about just topping off an epidural before we pull it back and top it off for one-sided blocks, that we should think about neuraxial opioids and use them thoughtfully, and in addition to this, we should consider doing a dural puncture, especially in those individuals that we want confirmation of placement, but also where we want better improvement of their analgesia. So hopefully you'll be a believer in some of these things that we've discussed today. Some of you will take some steps necessary to incorporate these into your practice. Coltrane would oftentimes say at each stage of the game, we have to keep on looking at ourselves. We need to look at the proximal side of the needle instead of the distal side of the needle when we're engaging in this thought process of epidural techniques. And hopefully with that, you can join us at other meetings that SOAP sponsors either come back next year and tell us some of your successes. But I look forward to answering some of your questions as we move along through this conference. Thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate it.